Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we finally have our interplanetary lander developed and stacked on top of a ginormous rocket. This is pretty much a clone of the heavy lifter. Unfortunately, the game doesn't let me clone it exactly, so I have to rebuild it every time. Uh, I also forgot to stop to uh, start recording until uh, after I'd left the launch pad. You'll notice that uh, I made uh, Bill get out and stay behind because uh, we really only need to take two people because the mission plan, of course, is that we uh, take this to the planet, land, and then uh, return to orbit and rendezvous with the pilot who has uh, delivered the transfer vehicle there. But as you can see, we're following a standard launch profile here. Now, it has been pointed out to me by several people that my uh, staging on these, these uh, six rockets around the outside is uh, not the most efficient, and uh, they are absolutely right. You know, it is possible to set these things up to, to drop in pairs, and that, that helps in a lot of ways, but um, unfortunately it also takes me a lot of effort, and I've had things explode randomly and whatever, so I've just kind of stuck with the six because I'm lazy, and we do have more than enough Delta V out of this thing. So yeah, you see what we have in the core is is the middle set of fuel tanks actually ends rather rather short. There's only two tanks feeling, feeding that large launch engine. And uh, the other fuel tanks in front of it instead have now have fuel lines that feed forward into my interplanetary transfer vehicle. Now, if you look, you can see that we have, well, we're going to throttle back here just for this staging because I've ha found out that if I stage with full thrust, sometimes that second tank gets pulled off by the change in forces. So uh, I started a lower th force and a uh, thrust up. Yeah, so we have basically the equivalent of two large extra tanks and using the aerospike engines as my thrust for the interplanetary transfer, that gives me roughly two kilometers per second delta V and I'll be able to drop those off before I land. And oh, and yeah, um, we have a stability issue here. Now, um, we're, as we're thrusting, we're turning off center, and it appears to be because I don't understand fuel transfer, and one of the tanks on the side has a fuel in it, or is, is being depleted, and one of the others, the other one, is not. It has fuel fuel, so... Um, uh, what I do is I disable fuel flow in this one and try to see if I can thrust with a, a lower thrust level. You see, we still have fuel in that one, so we are becoming unbalanced at this time, which is not ideal. So maybe we can salvage the mission. We're going to fire the thrusters at lower levels of thrust, and hopefully the capsule's gyroscopes can compensate for it. Unfortunately, it means that the thrust advantage we had over the previous, the, the interplanetary transfer vehicle, if you remember, it had the small uh, two meter engine on it. And that took forever. It took like 15 minutes to reach interplanetary velocities. Oh yeah, as soon as we go to full thrust, we lose orientation. So we got to cut the power and let it come back. And we'll probably run about one third power, hopefully. That won't be too much of a penalty. But thankfully, you're watching this after the fact, and uh, I can just time accelerate the video as we accelerate up to orbital, up to transfer velocity. So yeah, we're going to need to reach escape velocity from the planet Kerbin, and from there we're going to need about 800 more meters per second to perform this transfer uh, onto this orbit, which will bring us out and bring us back. So I mean, yeah, we're talking about two kilometers per second we want, and that will bring us back, uh, ideally, onto a collision, um, a collision orbit that will graze the atmosphere and we can use for aerobraking. Really, because this is a lander, we want to be able to pick our landing spot. So having spare fuel left over is going to be highly desirable. You do not want to put this down in water or lava or liquid, whatever it's going to be on the surface of, of uh, EVE. So... Um, yeah, so we're just going to run this, and you can see that we're time accelerating at about four times time acceleration. And we're just about to reach escape velocity here at 2.5 kilometers per second. Of course, we're really high up because we're accelerating more slowly. Now we want to raise our uh, Apple apps up to 29,570-something. We're slightly above it. 
and then that will put us on a very close uh, in well, close encounter, but we won't know until we leave the sphere of influence of the planet Kerbin. Now, of course, you can go into the config and modify the number of patched conics to draw. That is a really good idea, and I should do it again sometime, but this is what the stock version is going to look like for most of you if you're trying to do this, this maneuver. Oh, yeah, just keep the sun behind the planet. There we go, getting very close. We're going to cut the, the rockets at 29,570. And, oh, okay, we slightly overshot, but I think we're going to be fine. So let's take stock of our fuel situation. We're like 700 kilometers up now, moving at quite a clip. You can see the orbit goes round, but we can't tell whether it actually re-encounters the planet Kerbin. Uh, yeah, you can see also that just random floating point errors and floating point approximations mean that our exact apoapse is changing randomly. So yeah, we get no, no fuel left in those tanks. We get a bunch of fuel left there. Plenty in the middle tank. That's good. We, if we were draining fuel from that middle tank, we would be aborting this flight now. Yeah, we've actually managed to kind of balance these tanks out, so we should be able to re-enable fuel flow. Uh, and we will at least not be too unbalanced when we arrive at the other end, actually. So we, we basically used about one of those large tanks and maybe, you know, half of those little, one of those little tanks. Oh yeah, we've got to jettison it. And so now we shall time accelerate out. And wonder, wonderful, the floating point errors mean that this thing is actually coming forwards. Um, and as you notice, the collisions are disabled during on-rails motion to uh, save the physics engine from exploding, I imagine. That will probably follow us on its orbit around. I wonder if it will encounter the planet. There's the moon there and the planet Kerbin taking one last look before our long sojourn into deep interplanetary space. This vehicle is now down to 52.3 tons. If you remember, that is still 20 tons lower than the other lander that I had. And the other lander still would have needed extra tanks for the boost phase into this interplanetary trajectory. Now it's 65,000. Let's get there. We are inter interstellar space now. We need to take a look and see if we have an encounter. And it looks like we don't. So what we would want to do now is adjust our orbit slightly to bring it back onto an encounter orbit. Now it looks like our semi-major axis is a little high. It says 21.687 gigameters. And to get an exact multiple of two, it should be something like 21.588 gigameters. So now I am going to have to fight the Kraken to adjust my orbit. And this could take some time. As we know, we're traveling at 10 points, 1067. Yeah. We're traveling at over 10 kilometers per second. And the Kraken is definitely going to be working here. Thankfully, by the time 1.17 appears, it, the devs have claimed that the Kraken will be conquered. And this maneuver will be relatively easy. So yeah, let's uh, burn retrograde just a little. We're going to try and reduce our semi-major axis so that we come onto an encounter. We want to be able to see back along the orbit so that we see the encounter happening. And as soon as we give any thrust, we... Yep. Oh, wait a second. We're just doing some adjustments here. I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I accidentally hit prograde and it started to flip around. This happens really slowly. So we could bring it back again. We, we just want to slow the semi-major axis down a little. You see there's some random rotations as well that we're picking up. And yeah, any well, this is us putting a tiny amount of thrust on and we're now rotating. The Kraken seems to amplify the asymmetry in the fuel loads right now. While we were able to manage this getting into orbit, it seems to be a bigger, bigger problem now that we're traveling at, you know, speeds in which the Kraken walks, let's see. Uh, it's burning just a little, falling away again. This could be a very slow change. I'm, I've got the semi-major axis down to 21.609. I just have, you've just got to drop it another, you know, 
30 million meters or 30,000 kilometers. See how tiny that is? 30,000 kilometers isn't even this, the width of the, the carbon system. You know, that's, that's smaller than the width of the carbon system. It's just that difference changes the time that it takes to go around the, the sun long enough that when I get back, carbon and its moons have moved too far ahead and I can't touch their sphere of influence. So I'm 10,000 kilometers away from my ideal semi-major axis and again, falling off axis. Oh, hopefully I can get it on this one. Let's get ready, a little, another little nudge. We want to we wanna have slightly longer because, oh, there we go. So there, we start our encounter at 21,591. So there we go. We're going to encounter it early-ish. And now we just want to orbit. So there we go. And we're going to, of course, uh, use the 10,000 times time acceleration and the four times video magic post-editing. You see, <laughs> well, let's take stock of our fuel there. Didn't change very much. So this is uh, essentially 400,000 times normal speed. The actual journey is going to be about 200 days of clock time. And since there are about 100,000 seconds in a day, this will still take me, you know, 30 seconds or so to go around. Now, of course, we want to we want to come out of time acceleration roughly 10 days before the encounter because that will let us set up um, It'll let us check that we're actually on course. It'll let us make adjustments to our periaps with a, using a little less fuel. Well, using tiny amounts of fuel, but at least having some certainty that we're going to arrive where we arrive. So we're definitely still in an encounter trajectory. And that's good. We're going to zip around the back of the planet there. Wow, 755 kilometers. That is pretty darn good if I... Uh, do say so myself, although it really does entirely come down to luck at this level. You're really entirely gambling on the precision of their floating point implementation. And I say floating point implementation being uh, the computer has certain limits and their algorithms have certain limits. And it is a big problem to fight against these, uh, having you know actually written proper simulations. So here we go. We're going to come back in. We're dropping the acceleration down and we're almost reaching the sphere of influence. You can see how we're actually moving very slowly with respect, it looks very slow with respect to the, the sphere of influence. You don't want to hit it too fast, honestly. Here we come, coming up on intercept and we'll switch back to normal time acceleration. Wait a second, what was that? Um, okay, so we're still on 700 kilometers, but where, uh, where's my autopilot? Where's mechanical jab? Uh, well, you know, that is interesting. I've never had that happen before. So we have fuel. Um, where would my autopilot be? Uh, oh, okay. It's usually, I usually stick it on the side of the capsule, but uh, I don't see it here. It appears that um, time acceleration has managed to destroy my autopilot. And so... Uh, I'm going to have to fly the rest of this mission manually. But that'll be next time. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.